All right, let's start. So uh, welcome guys. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this next session in Dynamics 365 user group for India uh, user group. Today we have a session on Power BI uh, embedded in Dynamics 365 finance and operation, which will be delivered by Ashish Srivastava uh, and myself uh, briefly. And we also have Sunil Gaur joining us from Microsoft today. Uh, before we start with the session, uh, quick summary about the group journey so far and uh, where we are. So we launched this group in July this year and in last couple of months you can see we have done some sessions. Uh, we have done around 12 sessions so far and as a part of those sessions we also did a power platform convergence series which talked about all the platform convergence between Dynamics 365 finance and operations and the power platform. We also have covered few sessions on Business Central because this platform we are creating for the whole Dynamics 365 family of products. So if you are working in Dynamics 365 field service or customer engagement, feel free to reach out and use this platform to share your knowledge with the wider uh, group. Uh, so you see group volunteers, so feel free to reach out to one of us if you want to know more about this group. And we have reached a milestone of 550 members on LinkedIn recently. So we would like to thank everyone who has joined the group and supporting us in this drive. So thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, a quick glimpse on the speaker board. So all the sessions which have been delivered, we have the speaker board uh, available for you. So these are all the people who have come forward, shared their knowledge, helped us, uh, mentored us to deliver these sessions so far. So a big applause to all of them and thanks a lot. Uh, it really helps to see and it, it also encourages other people to come forward and share the knowledge. So keep supporting us uh, and let's take this group to the next level and um, support each other. All right, uh, with that, what I will do is uh, I will quickly hand it over to uh, uh, Sunil for talking uh, with us about something around what's coming ahead in platform convergence. And then I would also like to uh, let other people who are in who gave the sessions and who are available in this uh, in this call, if they would like to open up, they can say something about uh, the group activity so far. So Sunil, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rajat. Uh, let me quickly share my presentation here. Can you all see the presentation now? OK, cool. Yeah, so hi, good morning. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, Sunil Garg here. So Rachid gave me only 30 minutes, so I'm going to quickly speed through the content here. I have 27 slides, but yes, I will need more than two minutes per slide, so which means I don't have enough time, so I'll quickly rush through. Um, so quickly we'll cover, you know, approach to convergence, I think. Some of you must have already seen uh, you know, those slides, but I still wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about that if there are new members joining today just to level set and just to reiterate the same message. So I'll spend a couple of minutes there and then we'll try to quickly understand what's what happened and what is happening in one admin, one developer, one user um, space from a convergence perspective. And we can uh, have a short Q&A if, if we have time. So, you know, what is convergence and what is the motivation? You know, what are we trying to solve together, um, you know, when we say convergence? So if we, you know, take a step back, what we are trying to solve is not a new problem. I mean, this scenario set and these challenges has existed since the time we know uh, you know, ERP and since the time we know sales and marketing and all these different applications. And the reality is customers always had these multiple applications in their environment and they always had the business processes that span these multiple applications. So that is not new, but the challenge and the problem always existed for how we can integrate these applications so that the business process also naturally spans 
uh, these various applications and users don't have to switch between applications. So the problem has always existed and our ecosystem, uh, you know, all of you are ISVs, partners and customers. Somehow they found a way to figure things out and customize and try to solve one way or the other. So what we are trying to do now is, you know, it's an acknowledgement from Microsoft side that yes, you know, that is a problem space. We should actually have something out of the box where it, it's much more easier for various applications, at least the Dynamics applications, to be talking to each other uh, right off the bat so that such cross application business processes are much more aligned and integrated, um, you know, right out of the box. So that is the reason why convergence is now a big focus from Microsoft perspective, and that is what is being tried to solve. Now, convergence is a very broad um, topic, and it, the scope of convergence is too broad. So what we are trying to also see is how can we express this convergence in one short line so that customers are able to understand that, so that anyone that we all talk to, uh, it should just resonate right away. So which is why we have you know, coined this one liner that says one admin, one user, and one developer, right? Because when we look at convergence, convergence from a persona perspective is truly this, which is when a user is working in finance and operation, or, and that same user is working in sales or marketing or field service, their experience should be the same, consistent experience, they should not really feel that they are working in one application versus the other. From their perspective, they could care hardly less about what application it is. It's about how can I get my job done fast and efficiently and in a much more delightful manner. So as long as we can make sure that the one user comes together from an experience standpoint, then convergence would have met its objective. Similarly, from an admin perspective, there are, you know, theoretically, there are like four different admin uh, variations here. One is the admin that manages LCS. One is the admin that manages similar things on PPAC. One is the admin that manages finance and operation application. And one is the admin that manages, you know, data wars or, you know, sales application and whatnot. Now, can we bring these administrative experiences also uh, in, one, uh, in one experience? Can we converge there? So that is where one admin comes into play. And then last but not the least, our developer community, our developer ecosystem also needs to um, have the same tool set, for example, or consistent tool set when they are developing uh, applications for, say, finance and operation versus sales or marketing. It shouldn't be you know, different, different tool sets for each of the application. Instead, if a finance and operation developer is used to working in Visual Studio IDE, then why not allow or enable uh, you know, our developer community to also work in the same environment for doing plugins for data works, for example, because that is where the convergence is happening. So which is why one admin, one user, and one developer truly captures the essence of convergence. And, and that is why you know, we are um, you know, sharing that message with all of you. Now, uh, approach to convergence, again, uh, I'll quickly repeat. Uh, be opportunistic, don't rewrite, right? Uh, and that is the, these are the principles for Microsoft for us and also for everyone that we talk to as a guidance, which is the ask is not to go and rewrite what has been done because that is the most inefficient way of adding value to customers. But let us be very mindful and let us be very uh, deliberate with the knowledge that we have, the knowledge that we are learning every day as to what is happening in convergence, you know, what is virtual entities, you know, when should we use it, what is dual right, when should we use it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then any new development that we do, that should be using the latest uh, tools and technologies so that we are aligned with the direction, with the roadmap. Similarly, this cannot happen in one wave or two wave or one release. This will be a multi-year journey. So it will be a crawl, walk, and run approach. So that is kind of setting the expectation for us internally and also with all of us that you know you will see an incremental progress as opposed to one big bang saying that hey now we are done with convergence. Uh, the third uh, bullet is basically uh, it's it's kind of related to the previous topic or previous point, which is 
new work should align to the roadmap and to the direction uh, as opposed to going and rewriting what has been done already. And last but not the least, I mean, X plus plus investments will continue um, the way it has been going on. So if there are any concerns from that perspective, that is something you know we wanted to just address right uh, at the outset. And then I'll quickly hurry up here. Um, this is a technological slice on convergence, right? I mean, in the previous slide, we talked about what convergence means from a persona perspective. That was a scenario-centric approach, a, a user-centric approach. Here, it is a technical slice, meaning convergence will happen in every slice of the technology stack in Power Platform and also in finance and operations. So data and events, as you are probably aware, you know, things are happening and things will continue to happen in this space from an inter integrations perspective uh, for how uh, you know, we can uh, converge more naturally out of the box. Similarly, we talked about admin scenarios. That is where the security uh, authentication and authorization comes into play. There will be opportunities to converge on that front as well. Similarly, storage. Uh, I'll talk about some of the scenarios we are working on that front, so I'll quickly jump to the last two slides, which is Power Apps, Admin Center, you know, LCS, PPAC, extensibility. You know, all of these areas will have uh, scenarios where we will be converging based on the use cases and opportunities. So let's quickly understand what has, um, you know, what what is going on in one admin space now. As we know, uh, when customers deploy environments, I mean, we really want an experience where it is a one-click deployment, and then behind the scene, a converged environment is what gets deployed. So this is what um, has been released earlier this year in LCS, if you remember. Um, there is Power Platform uh, integration that is enabled, and that actually gets us the environment deployed together for FNO and Dataverse, as opposed to two different clicks and two different experiences. Uh, now, what this gets us is basically off the bat, uh, the required solutions, the required glue is already established on the platform so that customers don't have to go and install virtual entity solutions separately versus you know, dual ride solutions separately. Instead, Everything is right there and everything is already linked and plumbed for us to start using it. Now, uh, I'll quickly skip this in the interest of time. Uh, this is an interesting slide. So, uh, and please take all these timelines with a grain of salt. Uh, this is our uh, you know, internal planning slide. We are just sharing from a transparency perspective. Uh, I mean, the plan is somewhere, uh, you know, after 2023, somewhere between 2023 and 2024 is when you know, we expect LCS uh, to be kind of deprecated and all the functionality uh, you know, should be and will be in PPAC. And PPAC becomes the admin center, if you will, for finance and operations as well. And then after uh, some time, you know, LCS will slowly uh, wean out. So that is the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that is the key message out of this slide. So please take some time to kind of digest this. Um, and this is again, uh, two, you know, almost a year and a half away. And this is all subjected to what progress and how much progress we are able to make in moving functionality from LCS to PPAC. And if that gets delayed, then this gets delayed as well. But in principle, it is uh, it should be expected that, you know, we will be looking at uh, a time where PPAC becomes the admin center for finance and operation as well and LCS will slowly start taking a backseat. Now, let's quickly jump into one developer. Now, from a one developer perspective, as we mentioned in the initial slides, the idea is let's have a consistent tool set. Let's converge on the tool set, and let's also make it easy for developers to get a environment where they can develop on a converged platform, right? today. A developer gets a FNO environment separately. A developer gets a Dataverse environment separately. They go through like a 20 step process that we have published uh, to kind of link these two environment and then do the development and somehow generate the, the code packages for FNO separately from Dataverse separately, then go and deploy them separately. You know, there's a lot of hoops our developers have to jump today to make this work. So the idea is, we want to rethink 
of how a developer environment looks like for a converged uh, platform. And I'll quickly uh, jump to, I mean, this is today's architecture as we all know, uh, right? But the, the future architecture that the work has already started uh, is basically have a cloud environment. I mean, if you remember, and you know, maybe all of you know that, the developer environment for Dataverse is a cloud environment, uh, a true cloud environment. Whereas for FNO, you know, we have VM-based, uh, you know, developer environments. So the idea is let's have a true cloud developer environment, just like a sandbox, for example, right? And the sandbox today is pre-connected using the Power Platform integration. Well, the same thing should apply to a developer environment also, where the developer can say, hey, I want a Power Platform integration enabled dev environment. And then behind the scene, the environments get deployed just like Sandbox. There's no difference except for some additional tooling that is available to enable developments, right? So that is the idea here and the work has started. So, you know, we should expect something to share with all of you uh, in the first quarter of next year or at least sometime in April, May timeframe, where we would want all your help to come and help us validate and uh, you know work with us uh, through a preview program and whatnot. So stay tuned for that uh, you know that 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 uh, information. So now from a one user perspective, things that has been recently shipped and generally made available. I mean, as you all know, last year you know virtual entities were made available for financial operations. In July, we increased the number of legal entities that can be supported in dual right from 50 to 250. And then in October, a couple of months ago, uh, business events and card events uh, or data events for financial operations through Dataverse uh, was made generally available. So this now opens up the doors where Dataverse connector for, for uh, Power Automate and Logic Apps uh, will be available for finance and operation scenarios as well, which means sometime next year, uh, we should expect finance and operations connector to be deprecated, right? I mean, we will announce the deprecation of finance and operations connector as well. Uh, once we make sure that functionally the data bus connector is on par with uh, finance and operation scenarios, and then you know we have converged on the, on the connector ecosystem from that perspective, right? And then um, this also enables uh, extensibility using C sharp plugins uh, on data works for financial operations, because now you will be able to execute business logic when something happens in financial operation, uh, either via business events or data events, and the logic can execute on data works, right? So this is additional tooling that that is now available for our developers to to have a choice as to how should I do my extensions. So this is one step closer to where we want to be. Now, uh, here is a quick demo. Um, I will come back to the demo if we have time, uh, but for now, let me quickly skip. Uh, so what is next uh, in one user from a Dataverse platform perspective? So the first scenario is a very important scenario and we will need all your help, right? Uh, but not right now, maybe in three to four months time, uh, I will you know, reach out and I, we will have uh, conversations more in this. But what we are working on is, today when you see, when a developer wants to write a business logic that actually spans both the platform. Like for example, if I start a transaction in X++, and then I also want to go and do some write operations in sales application in Dataverse, and then I want to come back into X++ and then I want to continue the transaction and then commit the transaction. Then if the transaction is successful, it should commit on both sides. But if the transaction fails, it should roll back on both sides so that it truly behaves like one platform, right? And there is no data inconsistency problem. The developers don't have to think if I'm, I'm writing this logic for FNO or for Dataverse, and if I'm doing it for both, how do I manage this myself? I mean, it is not possible for a developer to manage this uh, in an efficient manner, right? So basically what we are looking at is to enable one transaction on one platform, because if 
we don't have one transaction, then we cannot truly say that the platforms have converged because then the platform are actually behaving in two different ways. Instead, it has to be like a truly one platform. So what a uh, little bit more technical details here just to uh, enable some food for thought, uh, you know, as we conclude the session. So what we are looking at is to converge the databases, right? So uh, today we have finance and operation database, uh, which is AXDB uh, in a separate, you know, server, a separate, you know, Azure SQL. And then we have our sales and marketing database sitting somewhere else in a, you know, physically different uh, Azure SQL. So the idea is we want to bring finance and operation into the same database physically um, so that the finance and operation schema sits in the same database alongside with sales, field service, marketing, and all of the data verse schema. What that will allow us to do is to enable one transaction using native SQL capability itself so that we don't have to do anything different. We don't have to write some additional code to make it work, but we can just use the, the native SQL capability itself. Now it is easier said than done. It is one of the hardest problem that we have started to look into. It will take time and we will need all the help from you. So it is a request to start thinking about it and we will be having you know, a lot of discussion in this topic and we will be asking for a lot of help for you to help us validate. So that is uh, the one of the major scenarios that we are working on. And the second um, uh, key scenario is now that business events are available in Dataverse, um, it will be available from finance and operations, from sales, from marketing, from field service, and even third party external applications, right? Because business events and cut events are available for external applications also. So which means Salesforce, SAP, Oracle, you know, all these external applications can send their events to Dataverse now. So it puts us in a very unique opportunity where we can now derive insights into a business process, right? We can now go and give this information to our customers that, look, the opportunity was confirmed three days ago and the sales quotation is getting created like you know 10 days later right so which means the turnaround time for an organization to create a sales quotation from the time the opportunity was closed is almost two weeks or three business weeks is that efficient enough or is that not good we need to derive these insights and start giving it and surfacing it for our customers so similarly so when we think about this it's actually a very strong concept especially when we think about doing this across a business process that spans multiple applications, right? Whether it is first party applications or whether it is first party plus third party, because we have those events now, we can know when was the opportunity created, when was the opportunity confirmed, when was the sales order created, when was the sales order picked, packed, shipped, when was the invoice posted, when was the payment done, right? So we can derive a ton of insights into a business process to understand the productivity metrics, to understand the performance metrics of an organization. And we can enable a lot more capability uh, using this, right? So that is the second scenario. And again, we will need a lot of help. Uh, we are making faster progress on this scenario than the previous scenario because of the nature of complexity. So we may want your help sooner on the second scenario uh, to help us kind of keep us on the track from a design perspective and also help us validate and share your scenarios. So please ping me offline and you know we'll be happy to connect and we can take this forward. Uh, now from a Power Apps perspective, the, from a very high level, I know I have four minutes, so I'll try to quickly cover. Uh, what we are, I'll actually cover this slide. This slide is important. So what we are doing is right now, it is possible to pin UCI apps in finance and operation. That functionality is available. It is being refined and tweaked, uh, but we, we can do that today. The second thing that we want to do and we are working on, and sometime next year this will be available, is the reverse, which is we should be able to pin X++ forms into UCI so that 
uh, we can enable such experiences sooner than later. And then the third one is, you know, the PCF controls that are available for Power Platform, those PCF controls should also be available for finance and operations. So that one time we invest in a PCF control and it can be used everywhere, right? And then as we increase the usage of PCF controls in finance and operation, finance and operation UI will naturally come closer and closer to Power Platform. So it's a very natural progression and nothing artificial that, that we have to do. So that is at a very high level um, that, that you know, we are working on from a Power Apps perspective. And from a dual ride standpoint, I'll quickly skip this. I think we all know about dual ride. Uh, this is the important slide. Uh, I mean, most of the business processes and entities that were that were planned has been delivered uh, from a dual ride perspective. There are last few uh, entities that have been worked on, which is primarily from an activities perspective. So once that, I mean, that will be also completed based on uh, the plan that we have here. So that is the work that is being done in dual right, in addition to all the fundamentals work, which is performance and stability and reliability. You know that is a continuous investments from our perspective. So those are the areas that we are, uh, you know, working on dual right. So I I am happy that I was able to cover in 28 minutes or 25 minutes. I got actually five minutes late from <laughs> Rachit, so I still have two minutes. So I'll I'll open up for any questions if there are. Well. Any questions, guys? Anyone has any question? I think, Sunil, what you have uh, shown is really, uh, as you said, food for thought. It will keep us awake at night to think about what's going to happen. And we are there to help and test drive and uh, take this forward. Uh, so let us know how the community can help in uh, bringing these features to GA uh, and happy to see if you want to show us some demo, please go ahead. We will uh, continue with the power yeah, session. I'll, I'll play this. I'll play this and then I have an ask which I will talk about after this. Sorry, it's not playing, Sunil. Can you all hear? No, we can't hear. Uh, uh, can, any, can, can anyone hear? We can hear you talking, but not the um, the video. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I I'm not sure what is happening. Uh, so let us not spend time on that. But uh, sorry, I maybe, mean, you can maybe. View Sorry, maybe if somebody just play on the button, if you are seeing that video, if you click on play, maybe you can, you know, hear it. it yeah, will... that, that works. Yeah, maybe we all can click at the same time. Let's spend three minutes, look at the demo, and then we can come back. So I am able to play it. I'm not sure why, but I'm able to play this. OK, yeah. so let's all play. I mean, on local, let, let's all play that.
Is the demo complete now for all? Almost. Just okay. 30 more seconds. Uh, yeah. I'll wait. I think they've nearly finished. Yeah, so it is it is finished actually. Finished okay. 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 So that was a quick, uh, you know, a short demo to kind of showcase what is available now, and how these different technologies, you know, right from power portals to power apps to, uh, you know, virtual entities and business events and card events and power automate and teams, you know, every in singular technologies coming together to enable this end-to-end -end scenario. And that's the convergence that we are looking at. So the last um, ask I had is, and I was kind of um, you know, brainstorming with Rachit as well. We are thinking of doing a hackathon for platform convergence. And at a very high level, what this will mean is, you know, we will request for participation where you know ISVs, partners, and customers can basically participate and build apps. Uh, you know, it, maybe it can be a one week of hackathon where you know we build apps and we then showcase the apps, and then you know we can have if the first one is successful, then we can have this as a regular uh, rhythm. So that way, and this will be based on the technologies that are that are GA, right? So this is different from the preview workshop that we do. Uh, because the objectives are different. So here the objective will be to uh, educate, learn, uh, create awareness, and at the same time, spend time to do hands-on and, and showcase the applications that everyone is building. Um, is that a good idea? Will there be participation? What do you think the community will react? Great idea. I mean, OK. OK, so um, I mean, we haven't figured out the logistics yet and you know um, all the mechanics for doing this, uh, but we can certainly use help <laughs> um, if you guys have any ideas for you know how how we can make it effective, right? Uh, and I'll be happy to discuss offline as well with with any of you that is interested to kind of partner with us and kind of help us in this process as well. So, uh, send me messages offline if you're interested, then we can uh, I can invite you to our meetings where we discuss this and you can actually help us, uh, you know, advice and, and whatnot. So with that, Rachit, I'll hand off to you and thanks all. It was great talking to you all again and uh, back to you, Rachit. Thanks, Sunil. It was great listening to you as always. A lot of insights which you have shared and uh, I'm excited about next year, all these features becoming GA and how we can help to bring them to GA uh, is something definitely will be an interesting journey. So if people who wants to participate, please feel free to reach out to Sunil or myself. I can share uh, some more links. Uh, we can create some forms where people can people can express their interest in participation in Hackathon and maybe we can use that to drive it forward. But thanks a lot, Sunil. Um, I'll just share my screen and if we have any more speakers from this speaker board present in the meeting and who would like to unmute and share something before we move forward, that would be great. All right, so um, okay, I'll move forward. So today what we are discussing is uh, we are discussing about Power BI embedded in Dynamics 365 finance and operations and the session will be presented by Ashish Srivastava and myself. Uh, so uh, just a quick introduction about the speakers. Ashish, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank, thank you, Richard. Uh, so myself, uh, Ashish Srivastava, like uh, I'm right now working 
for one of the customer uh, like Hitachi construction uh, and machinery uh, as a technical consultant. So I've been working in Dynamics uh, since uh, 2005. So it's been like 16 years. Like, so I started with Xaptra 3.0 and then worked on the various <clears throat> Dynamics versions. So, so like uh, I have witnessed uh, the yeah, uh, the emergence of this uh, Dynamics thing. So, so it has evolved a lot. Like it used to be uh, like. Uh, uh, middle level companies product, but now like this dynamics can be used for like for very large enterprises. So like very proud to be part of the Microsoft dynamics. Yes, I think that's it from my side. Over to you. Thank you, yeah. Thank you Ashish. Uh, guys, myself, Rachit, I've been working in the field of dynamics 365 since 2005. Same as Ashish started with Exacta 3.0 as a developer and uh, currently I'm working with PwC based in Melbourne. So let's quickly come to the agenda for today. Uh, so what we will discuss is we will discuss some key concepts of Power BI Embedded. We will see a process of how to create a new Power BI Embedded report in finance and operations. Ashish will be talking about a recent case study where he developed a very powerful and useful uh, Power BI report, uh, and he will share his lessons learned during that journey, and we will then take any questions. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat window. And please note that these views are expressed by the speakers based on their experience. It does not represent the view of their employers or Microsoft. And as this session is recorded, so uh, be mindful that uh, your name may appear during the recording. All right, let's continue. So uh, I'll talk through the key concepts and then I'll hand it over to Ashish for the demo. So a few things. Uh, uh, about Power BI Embedded. What is Power BI Embedded and how is it different to the normal Power BI uh, flavor? So what is it? So the key difference between Power BI Embedded and the normal Power BI report is that this flavor of Power BI reports can be embedded in your business applications, which means users don't have to change their browser or switch to a different dashboard to view the report as well as it gives you the drill down capabilities to go to the actual form within the application from the Power BI report. So imagine a scenario you are looking in, in finance and operation, you are on a workspace looking at a Power BI report, you click on a particular section and it takes you to the detail page within finance and operation of the transactions from which that value came on the Power BI report. So these type of scenarios are enabled by Power BI embedded. What also it does is it helps you to secure this data uh, by using the finance and operations security framework. And that is how you get an additional layer of security on these Power BI reports, which are coming out of Power BI embedded experience. Now, some key concepts. Uh, there are a few terms which you will hear when you will talk about Power BI. So things like entity store, BYOD and what is the difference between Entity Store and BYOD. Uh, we will also talk about star schema and difference between DAX and MQuery. So first of all, why these tools were created? The reason is because uh, Dynamics 365 Finance and Operations uh, is a SaaS based application. The database is SQL Azure as of today. It's in cloud and we don't have direct connectivity to this database. So there was a need for customers to get access to this data for analytics purposes. And for those purposes, these different frameworks were created. So first I'll talk about uh, Entity Store. So Entity Store is also uh, uh, known as AXDW by technical people. So when you install finance and operations and you when, when you log into your developer machine, uh, and you open SQL Server, you will see there is a database named as AXDW. Uh, so the business name is Entity Store. What this does is it actually uh, stores the aggregated data of your current system. What this means is it's like a half cooked data which can be sent to Power BI. It, it stores your aggregate measurements. It, it stores your summarized information of the transactions. So this entity store, think of it 
if I, I I'm not going too deep, but think of it as a half cooked database which can be used by Power BI reports directly. So you don't have to do the calculations and get the summarized value from the Dynamics database outside of Dynamics. So AXDB is stores all the aggregated data. It's optimized for reporting purposes. Now these aggregate measures are, uh, you will see that we are highlighting that these are star schema. So we will talk about what is a star schema. Uh, and that is the whole purpose of having AXDW. The way data gets populated into these in this database is via batch processes, which you have to configure in finance and operations. There are docs link which we are we will be sharing in references towards the end. What is BYOD? Uh, BYOD is a SQL database which sits in your own subscription where you can export data from data entities. So uh, for finance and operation, data entities is like a normalized view of your data. So in reality, your data is sitting in multiple tables, but with the help of a data entity, you can have a flat view of your data. And then you can export that flat view of the data to an external uh, SQL Azure database, which is called as bring your own database uh, in finance and operation. So the way to do is that you have to configure a data source connection and you have to enable this as a destination for your data export projects. So what this allows you to do is you can export the data of your data entities to a SQL Server uh, database, which is in cloud. And from that database, you can build your Power BI queries on top of it. Uh, the the key uh, thing which you have to be mindful while configuring this connection is that the username which you use to configure the connection should have create and write permissions in that database because generally when you give a connection string and you click validate it only tests tests the connectivity but when you actually start uh, sending out data it might fail because the user is not having right permission so that's one of the key things you should take care when you are configuring byod so the difference between byod and entity store is that BYOD is creating, is uh, having the data of your data entities, which is a normalized view of your data, while entity store is having the view of the data which is optimized for reporting purposes. So BYOD can uh, provide you capabilities to mash up your data with external data sources, while the entity store data is purely made of data which is generated by finance and operations. So these are a few key, different, uh, few key differences between BYOD and Entity Store. These concepts have like, they are quite deep if we if we, we can have like dedicated session on them. But in this session, our objective is to tell you that these are different ways to get access to finance and operations data so that you can build Power BI dashboards on top of them. Now the latest feature which has been recently generally made available, uh, it's sort of, uh, hot of the press that you can export your finance and operations data in data lake. Uh, what this means is that you have to create your own uh, Azure data lake, which is of type uh, Gen2 storage in your subscription. And then you can install this add-in from LCS. You can do configurations in Dynamics Finance and Operation to select the tables and entities which you want to export. And they, through this uh, data pipelines, the data is sent to data lake. From Data Lake, you can write your own uh, Apache Spark uh, things, or you can use Azure Sign Apps to build some more analytics on top of that, and then you can consume it in Power BI. So these are the links we have shared here, uh, which you can use to get access to finance and operations data to build your Power BI dashboards. We will quickly look at few key concepts when you go towards Power BI world, uh, which are around DAX and then query because these terms are used quite frequently. And we just want to highlight the key difference between them. So DAX is an expression language. It helps you to create formulas and do calculations on the data which you have received in Power BI. While the Power Query, the M Query, the formula language is more about the transformation layer. So if you have to transform your data, merge data from multiple data sets, that is where the M query comes into picture. Ashish, do you want to add anything here on DAX and M query? Yeah, so, so 
so the power query actually generally used for the cleansing of data like when you before you you can use uh, that data in the report so you can uh, do the the way actually we do the extract etl job in the, so this power query is very powerful that it's used even in the excel also you can uh, without with the excel tool also you can do the extract uh, transform and load uh, so it's basically used for the uh, cleansing of data and uh, the transformation of data and the DAX query is basically the calculation like when we uh, load the data and on top of that we want to uh, do some uh, calculation so that we do it uh, with the with the DAX query so I, I will show all of this when I show the example uh, uh, in my demo so uh, that uh, I will show the difference here okay thanks Ashish uh, just one last thing before I hand it over to Ashish for further demo. We'll quickly talk about star schema. So you might have seen in the entity store there was a line that it's based on a star schema model. So if you look in this diagram, you can see a star being generated and there are two main things. One is a fat and one is a dimension. So the so the key concept is to understand the meaning of dimension and fat and what are the benefits of it. So Consider dim as your master data. So dimensions could be your store name. It could be your salesperson name. It could be your employee ID. It could be your customer account. And fact is more like a transactional data that what has happened in relation to that particular dimension. So if we talk a very common example of Power BI reporting is sales happening in a region. So every sales has multiple things like who was the sales representative in which store that sales was made who was the customer was uh, you know which product was sold so all these things become your dimensions and the actual transaction becomes fact so and each each of these tables have foreign keys and natural keys tied to them through which these tables are joined so these are like um, under the hood relations between these table and when you put your whole structure it becomes a star when you join them and that's why the name star schema evolved uh, the benefit of having a star schema is that your reporting is neat your your design is clean and it can scale up as your volume increases so if you don't have a very uh, good uh, relational database you may still work fine with few lower volumes of data but as the volume of the data grows if you have star schema relation in place your performance will not be impacted. So it's very important to consider when you start modeling your tables uh, for any analytics perform analytics consumption. So with that, I will hand it over to Ashish now. The floor is all yours, mate. Uh, go for it. Oh, thank, thank you, you Richit. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So in today's session, actually, uh, 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 Rachit has already covered the concept, but I will still explain it like while going through my demo. So I will explain this concept. <clears throat> so uh, so Rachit just explained uh, the uh, the star schema. So so uh, in creating the Power BI uh, embedded report, the data modeling is the very important piece, how we model the data. And for that, actually, we need, uh, uh, so we generally use the star schema, which is very powerful and uh, uh, tool to uh, do the data modeling. And so what is the star schema? Star schema, actually, we have the the two type of tables one is the fact table and one is the dimension table so fact table is the table actually which is the flag table we have all the transaction okay like uh, uh, the sales orders lines so we have like sales line table which is the fact table which has all the lines which uh, uh, and uh, all the transactions okay and what is the dimension table and how we you want to measure the uh, the data in the fact table that is the dimension table so in sales order we have the customer we have the item group we have like a uh, lot of financial dimensions like department cost center and uh, all so if you want to measure the data based on uh, these dimensions so that is uh, you we use the dimension table okay so uh, sorry, are you sharing your screen, Ashish? Will you oh, be sharing your oh, screen? Oh, I'm sharing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought I'm sharing. Okay, so, so just a minute. Okay. Oh, I need to use my PowerPoint slide. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Sorry. Okay, this is. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> so, so that's the uh, the star schema. So, how it looks like? Uh, I just want to give one uh, show one example, uh, which is the standard Dynamics AX uh, uh, embedded report uh, uh, in Dynamics, like you, the actual versus budget. So, if you uh, open that report, so this is the PBIX file, and how you get the PBIX file from the uh, Dy Dynamics is like uh, because all the PBIX file you can get it from Dynamics. Uh, so the, uh, where it is stored basically is if you go and go to our folder, uh, which is a service, okay, and then package local directory and uh, whatever the models you uh, 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 the package we have. So. So like like suppose I'm giving the example that I have my custom model so which I created so and then if you go to the resources and uh, uh, sorry uh, uh, as, uh, in in the model and then if you go to the AX uh, resource and here this is the resource actually and then if you go to the resource content and the Power BI here actually you have the the Power BI PBIX file. OK, so you can get the PBX file uh, from the uh, uh, from uh, this AOS service folder and and then you can actually open it and uh, uh, check the, the data modeling. OK, so this one like uh, uh, this is in this example that we have the star schema. So here in the star schema, uh, the good thing is like uh, how, how the relation is there. So it's generally one to many relationship. OK, so there are many records in the, uh, the fact table and uh, is one record in the dimension table. That's how the relation is uh, developed in the star schema. So is, so that's why we call it star because uh, the, uh, the fact table in the central and then we have the dimension uh, in the all uh, uh, different angles. So that's why we call it a star schema. So it's one to many relationship between the, uh, the fact and the dimension table. OK, so this is uh, 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 star schema. So another thing that uh, before because uh, I go to my case study like uh, so in my in our company, actually we recently started uh, using the Power BI report. OK, so uh, the first thing when we developed that was because we, we we didn't have experience on building the Power BI report. So the first thing what we did actually, we built the, the Power BI report using the BYOD. So basically we created some data entities in, inside the Dynamics and then using the our uh, data uh, uh, data management, actually we exported the data to external uh, uh, database that is uh, also like uh, Azure SQL database. So we exported the data and using the Power BI desktop, we connected that uh, uh, database and then we build a report. OK, and since this report we built on the uh, external uh, like uh, external database, so we can't uh, uh, we, we, ca we cannot use that report inside uh, the Dynamics uh, uh, workspace. So, so, so that that uh, so uh, so what we did actually we uh, uh, we export we use this report in the Power BI service. So reports in Dynamics can be viewed in uh, two different places. Like so, I'm just sh sharing the. Uh, Power BI service. So this is the this is called Power BI service. Okay. So uh, basically, we have, we the uh, we gave the users access in this Power BI service, and the the user could uh, see the report in the Power BI service. So this is how we built our first report. So the problem with this approach was like they it like uh, because uh, if you want to use the report with the Power BI service, you need the license. So 
so we gave this report access to selected users like selected executives only so they can access uh, uh, the, the the bi report so we 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 procured the license for them and then we gave the access in the power bi service so uh, okay so here actually we gave them access and they they could go and uh, run the report so so, but what's the benefit of for using uh, this uh, uh, Power BI service over uh, the entity stories? Like, uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to, uh, like, get the data from the multiple sources, like you get the data from Dynamics, you get the data from the Salesforce, you get the data from some other legacy system, okay, and then you want to do analyze the data. So. This is the best place you can uh, do the data analytics. So you'll have to uh, build the report on the Power BI service. Okay, so that's actually uh, that's the benefit of using the BYOD. In the BYOD, we, you can get the data from the multiple uh, places, and then you can build the report, and that that report you can view through Power BI service. Okay, so that was the uh, 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 that was the the first thing we developed. Okay, so when uh, we got the second report, so because the, that report actually we couldn't give access to uh, the, the whole organization. Like we had like fifteen hundred users, so we couldn't give it to all of them uh, uh, the access of those reports. So. So what we found, so uh, so the second report that we decided that we will build inside the Dynamics using the embedded Power BI. OK, so the benefit of using the embedded Power BI is inside the Dynamics. So first data will not go outside the Dynamics, like it's the inside. And then uh, this embedded Power BI, you can use the uh, security of the Dynamics to secure that report. OK, so that uh, you can give all the roles, uh, privileges, duties, whatever we have to secure that report and give the proper access to whom you want to give the access to that report. So that's the beauty of the, the uh, embedded report, and and this is free. Like it, it doesn't require license because Microsoft already packaged it inside the Dynamics. So this is uh, a, a really good uh, 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 tool that Microsoft given to Dynamics, so uh, that uh, we can build the Power BI and then we can do analytics inside the Dynamics. So that's how actually uh, and the. The challenge was like the the embedded Power BI was not very popular and like uh, like not many uh, companies use the embedded Power BI. So generally, companies use the the Power BI service because it's like easy and they can get uh, analyze the data from the multiple sources. So. <laughs> so it actually, uh, uh, and whenever we we were hitting the roadblock in 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 the um, in this embedded power BI, getting the information was very difficult. And and at this moment, actually, Microsoft support uh, helped us. Like so, we uh, uh, we worked very closely with the Microsoft support uh, for the issues, and they helped us and they guided us uh, in this uh, building this embedded power BI report. So. So that's how we started uh, uh, building this uh, um, uh, embedded Power BI report. So, so what was it? so there were a lot of learnings because uh, uh, we didn't have any experience of building this embedded Power BI. So what we did actually, first thing I did, like uh, I just went on Google and downloaded the Power BI desktop, and then I downloaded the latest version of Power BI desktop. OK, so when you develop the report on the power, latest version of Power BI desktop, it doesn't work in the embedded Power BI. So that's that was the first mistake I did. OK, so then Microsoft suggested OK that because the uh, embedded Power BI works only on the. Uh, the, the Power BI version, which is uh, before August 2020. So if I show in my um, tab box, like I have the Power BI desktop. So if uh, how you know that uh, what's the version we have? So if we go and you click on about, so you can see this my version is uh, somebody should. Uh, this is August 2020, so I'm using August 2020. So if you use any version before that, that's also fine. That you can use it and you can build the report and you can deploy it and it works fine in the Dynamics embedded Power BI. So that was the the first thing. Uh, uh, mistake I, I I did OK, so second thing like because I was new, so what I thought that OK, like the, uh, I, I uh, got the data from Dynamics, 
So uh, and then I uh, what I did actually, I just uh, added a custom table. So let me show it one example of the custom table. So. So this is my first report I built, so I added one custom table. So custom table is like you can simply go and write the uh, the query and automatically it will build one table for you and that table you can view it here uh, in the Power BI desktop. Okay. So so the problem with custom table is like uh, it uses. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so you can see the storage mode is import. So but uh, for embedded Power BI, it only supports direct query. So when you create a custom table, so which is import storage mode, then it will not work in the embedded Power BI. So you'll have to use the direct query. So you can see this by the second table that is uh, the storage mode is direct query. So it's only supports that direct query storage mode. OK, so this is this is the second problem I, I faced uh, while building the report. OK, so now actually I will go go to my uh, case study. So. Uh, so uh, so uh, what what uh, so our organization actually we were facing some problem with analyzing uh, uh, the delivery like uh, uh, like like uh, when we deliver the item, like uh, how many times we are delivering on time and how many times we are delaying the delivery. So we didn't have any proper report inside a dynamics to uh, analyze that data. And uh, so we built some SSIS report, but uh, that was not something because they wanted to analyze the data on the multiple uh, measures. Uh, like they wanted to analyze the data for particular customers and uh, wanted to see the progress by months and all. So, so that was not possible with the SSI support. So that we decided, okay, that we we should build the uh, the Power BI report. And this is very very uh, important report in most of the supply chain companies. Like to know that how efficient your supply chain to deliver the goods. So that's why we built this. Uh, uh, and the, the, the DIFORT report. So DIFORT means that is delivery in full on time. So how many times we deliver the goods within the within the time limit and uh, the the full quantity we delivered. That means like we suppose we have the the sales order. So and uh, and and how we compare it. So uh, in the sales order, we have the ship, uh, shipping date requested. So that the requested shipping that 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 was actually provided by the customer that 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 they want this item to be delivered on by certain this date. OK, so and then in dynamics, when you ship it, this then you have the delivery date. So so you compare the data, the delivery date with the shipping date requested. OK, and then you check what you check you check the quantity so how many quantity the customer ordered and how many quantities you are delivering so combination of these two is called difot the delivery in full on time so if you are, you have delivered all the ordered quantity before the shipping date requested that means your difot is met like you met uh, the difot okay so so that was the goal okay so that was the difot okay Okay, so and uh, and how we wanted to uh, 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 achieve this default. So we wanted to achieve uh, uh, check the default by order, by order line, and by quantity. So all the three factors we wanted to check. Okay, so by order means like uh, during like uh, this period, like suppose in the period of three months, last three months. Okay, so uh, how many orders we delivered on time? Okay, so that's uh, like suppose we create, uh, uh, we got uh, thousand orders. Okay, out of thousand orders, we we could deliver uh, uh, like uh, nine hundred orders on time. So how we know that 900 orders? So 900 orders means uh, for all the 900 orders for all the lines. OK, all the lines were delivered with all the quantity 
within the time limit. Then the uh, these 900 orders uh, is die for die for is met for those 900 uh, uh, orders. OK, and then we wanted to know by order line. So suppose in that three months period, we uh, we had 900 orders. Uh, sorry, thousand, thousand orders, but uh, we we had like 10,000 lines for each order. We had 10 lines. OK, so we, we had 10,000 lines uh, in that uh, last three months out of 10,000 lines. How many lines we delivered in in full? So suppose we delivered like uh, 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 9,000 uh, line or 9,500. So the die for is 95 percent. So the same thing by quantity. So we wanted to know by quantity, like in last three months, we we uh, uh, we got the order for like 100,000 quantity and we delivered uh, like uh, 95,000 quantity on time. So that's 95,000. 95% uh, is the die for for that. So so th that was uh, the goal to achieve with the die for. OK. So and uh, what impacts actually die for, uh, die for like uh, so so like why why the companies are, uh, are not able to deliver the uh, the quantity on time so there can be multiple reasons like why why the companies cannot deliver uh, in time so that the one thing is the company doesn't have sufficient stock because their planning is not. Uh, uh, good enough, so they uh, or they don't have enough storage uh, uh, facility. So, uh, so they couldn't uh, have that much inventory to deliver uh, to uh, to supply to the uh, uh, to meet the uh, uh, the requirement of the customer. Okay, so then uh, we we can never uh, met the die for. So that's the uh, regions uh, the companies uh, doesn't mean. And sometimes like. Uh, you have like a lot of problems like in the system or somewhere like uh, and then uh, delivery is stuck for some days and you are not able to deliver on time. So that also is, uh, uh, some in some cases it happens and then some cases like we have the disorganized warehouses. We, we don't have proper warehousing process and we are not able to deliver the, the item on time. So th these are the major reasons actually where when we it fails uh, the, those those reasons we wanted to analyze through our die for report. OK. So. I. <coughs> so how how we build this uh, embedded power BI report? OK, so uh, to build the embedded Power BI report, so we we first we uh, we create the dimensions like uh, how you want to measure the reports. Like you want to measure the report by customer, so the customer is a dimension. You want to measure the report by date range, so date is a, another dimension. If you want to measure the report by some financial dimensions like cost center uh, department or something, that, so that is another dimension. So. And first you create a dimension that, that is aggregate dimension and then we create aggregate measurement. So we we create the aggregate measurement. OK, and then we inside the aggregate measurement, we use the ag aggregate dimension. OK. So and aggregate measurement, what are the agreement uh, uh, me measurement? Uh, uh, what uh, different type of aggregate measurements we have. So we have two different types of aggregate measure. It, one is in memory real time and another one is the stage entity store. So. So initially Microsoft actually started with uh, the in memory real time uh, aggregate measurement and then later on they added uh, the stage entity store. So 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 what's what is, what is the in memory real time? So in memory real time, if you want to get some real time data, so then uh, uh, generally we use because this is pretty fast. So we use this in memory real time aggregate measurement. So but sometimes actually our data is huge, like we have a lot of data, we have a lot of calculation. So uh, so in that case, actually the preferred way is to use the staged uh, uh, aggregate measurement. So now I think with what I should do, I, I will just go through the environment. Uh, uh, my dev box, this is my dev box, and uh, I, I will show you like well, 
what I meant by aggregate measurement. So here we have this uh, cube. So this is actually aggregate measurement. OK, that uh, here we have the attributes and then I and I created some one measure uh, inside the aggregate measurement and this is the dimension. So we have the dimension. OK, so if you see uh, this aggregate measurement, so I am using the uh, uh, the uses is staged entity store because uh, my but I have like very large amount of data that I'm analyzing. So uh, so the best approach to use is the staged entity store. So if you go and uh, check most of this uh, uh, Microsoft standard cubes, you will see uh, that they use because they, they are uh, using like a lot of uh, uh, huge data, so they are using the staged entity store. But some of the uh, the aggregate measurement they use in memory. So, like I have the example. So this is the ledger activity measure. This is also standard Dynamics uh, aggregate measure, and you can see the here uses is in memory real time. So here we are using in memory real time. Okay. So. <clears throat> So, so, so first I what I did actually I created uh, uh, the measure. So before creating the measure, I actually basically uh, I wanted to know like uh, what are the different tables uh, because I was getting the table from data from multiple tables. So I created actually view. So if I can show, so yeah. So this is I created one view like I'm getting the data from multiple tables, and uh, here uh, we have the all the fields which I wanted to. Uh, pass to entity store and analyze the data on this uh, uh, these fields. OK, so. <clears throat> so so and. Uh, what what is the what was the another uh, problem like uh, uh, that I, I definitely want to discuss? And, uh, uh, so so measures actually like uh, you can uh, you can create in the in the dynamics. And you can create the measures in the Power BI desktop also. So suppose this is our Power BI desktop. This is the same report that I'm uh, I'm showing in the Visual Studio. So, uh, but it's uh, in the Power BI report. Uh, so it's in the Power BI desktop. So here, if you go and if, uh, if you see that uh, here we have the uh, the measures that if you I click on this, this is this is the custom measures I created inside the Power BI desktop. So you can see the uh, this is all DAX query. So uh, that's what we uh, Rachid explained that what is DAX. So we have I have written a lot, lot of DAX query in inside the Power BI desktop. So uh, you can see so a lot of calculation I'm doing inside that uh, inside the Power BI desktop. So so when I did like uh, uh, I was doing the bigger calculation uh, like uh, I had uh, like example is like I was using some uh, some calculation like this uh, order on time and I was doing a lot of calculation in in the Power BI desktop. So when I was using this big calculation inside the Power BI desktop, so my report was running very slow. It's very extremely slow and sometimes it was actually timing out. I still not showing any data. So, so like uh, and uh, we are frustrated. Like, why is like doing that way? Because I thought if the Microsoft, uh, if the Power BI has the given this capability uh, of uh, uh, adding the measure in the Power BI, so you should be able to handle it. But uh, I think for uh, direct query, is better to do the calculation uh, beforehand. So, so what I did actually in Dynamics, I. Uh, I whatever that I am doing in the uh, the Power BI desktop, I added the same logic in the uh, computed column in, in inside the Dynamics in the view. So here you can see like a lot, I added a lot of uh, logic. So what what it is doing actually if if you do uh, the calculate uh, if I you write the logic the computer uh, in the computer column in the view. So actually, it, before it moves the data to the entity store, it's doing all the calculation and it's uh, uh, pushing the only the calculated data in the uh, uh, entity store database. And then when you do the direct query, it's pretty fast. 
So that's the region actually I wrote uh, my logic inside the dynamics. OK, rather than doing it in the Power BI desktop. So uh, the another way you could directly go and create the uh, uh, the DAX query here, like a measurement and then put the DAX query and do the calculation. So that's also you can do that, but uh, uh, doing this uh, uh, with this approach is better approach. OK. So. OK, and. OK, what else like? Yeah, so when we actually uh, when we create uh, the the view and uh, uh, in dynamics, so it's better actually if you can uh, run the uh, uh, SQL uh, with the views and verify the data, what data you are getting before you push it in, into the entity store. So you can analyze the data, but it's uh, getting uh, proper data is not throwing any error. So then after that you can. Uh, 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 so after that, you can actually push the data into the entity store. So how how we push the data into to the, the entity store? So in Dynamics, we have if you go and then uh, in the system administration. So here we have the entity store. So in this entity store, actually you can see all your aggregate measurement. So it, it displays all the aggregate measurement. OK, like uh, I, I built one report for Dyfort. So here, so this one I, I enabled the refresh. OK, automatic refresh enabled and then I'm refreshing every day per day. OK, so so you'll have to enable this uh, uh, entity store integration here. And the, another thing you need to make sure that you have you are running the bad job. So there is a, a bad job to push the data from dynamics to AXGW entity store. So that is. That's uh, actually bad job name is full reset bad job. So that uh, make sure that bad job is running. If the bad job is not running, then it will not push the data to from the. Uh, from uh, Dynamics to AXDW database. So here if you go. So in this environment actually is, uh, is read out for uh, uh, some of the <coughs> or maybe we might have uh, uh, during uh, during the data export we might have restarted the server or something it, it, uh, so if you can go and you can st start that uh, bad job and once you start it so it will uh, uh, this uh, uh, here in this uh, entity store you will see the refresh so like I can show. So like you can see my data was refreshed on 312 uh, in this. OK, so sometimes like when you ref, uh, uh, refresh uh, the data, you get the error also here like some uh, because you you don't have a proper data in your aggregate measurement. So so that's why I was saying that you should analyze the data in the view and and the aggregate measurement before you push the data into the entity store. OK, so this was uh, another learning for me. So like uh, uh, because earlier I was just pushing the data and I, it was getting stuck and uh, it was throwing some error message. So that's uh, that's like uh, pushing the data from AXDB uh, to uh, AXDW. OK. And then. Uh, then we design the Power BI. Uh, desktop so here we go and then you can uh, start adding the visuals so you you can uh, add the tabs you can start adding the visuals and then you do the connection so basically how you check the connection so you'll have to go in uh, here and uh, here you have the data source setting so there actually you can see the connection string. So you can uh, see uh, like this is my local dev box. So I'm using the local and I'm connecting with the AHCW database. So this is how you uh, you uh, connect the, the the database. Okay. 
and uh, you can then uh, create all the visuals. You can create all those uh, measures and uh, sometimes you create the custom columns also like I created uh, the columns for the month, date and year. So this is another problem like what I did in my report. I created the the custom uh, columns inside the Power BI desktop. So rather than doing this is better to use the uh, the dimension uh, table like we already have the date dimension table. So if you uh, go here, then you see in Dynamix they have given multiple dates table like so this is the date uh, dimension table. So that dimension table if you is better to use in the aggregate measurement. So once you use this uh, date dimension table in the aggregate measurement, so uh, when you push the data, it actually uh, uh, creates the separate table for the dimension also. So you will get multiple tables. OK, so one is fact table and you get multiple dimension table and then you can create a star schema inside the uh, Power BI desktop. So that's the best approach to design that uh, Power BI desktop. OK. So so th this is this is the problem I'm showing like uh, like I'm, I have the custom uh, column uh, like uh, uh, the, I just added the columns and then I'm I'm doing these filters based on these columns here in the Power BI uh, desktop. OK, so. OK, and uh, another thing is like uh, when you develop the report in the, uh, the, the dev environment, so the problem is like uh, you can't see the result. So if, if I show if uh, in, in my dev box, if I show uh, like uh, any of the embedded report, so like I have this. Uh, this is the report, so it will not show anything. It's blank. So. How do you know that uh, when you develop the report, what how the data will look when when it is deployed and uh, 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 when it's deployed, uh, uh, like when the entity store is refreshed? Uh, so how you know that? So for that actually uh, to see the on-premise data, we have the on-premise gateway in uh, in uh, the Power BI uh, gateway. So I have installed the on-premise. Uh, Gateway. I have the on premise gateway. Sorry, I, I can't see it here, but I don't know why it's not showing. But uh, so this is the gateway. I, I installed it in my dev box. OK, so when you install it in your dev box, the uh, the, uh, the on premise gateway and then you log in it. So basically it creates the connection of your dev box in the Power BI service. So I can show that power. What, what is the what? Because I and then you can publish the report, this Power BI report in into the Power BI service. So that's how you you can publish uh, the report from dev environment to Power BI service, and you can give access to someone and uh, just to verify how it's looking in the dev environment before moving this report into the test or uh, some other environment. So in Power BI Desktop, this is a publish button. When you click on the publish, this report will be published. And once it is published, how it will look? I will show you because I just published one report. So yeah, so I published this report. Uh, I think today only 110. So this is my uh, the data set for that report, and this is the Power BI report. And this is the option you can share it with someone. So when you go to the data, how you know this report you published from the dev environment? So if you go here and go to the setting. So in setting you can you will see the gateway connection. So that's why I have said because I have installed the, the gateway and the on price gateway and then this gateway is connected. So so you can see the gateway connection and it should be running. It should be in the running state. Then only you can see the data in the Power BI service. And how you know that uh, I'm connected with my uh, local data? So here is the data source uh, credential. So this is the way actually uh, I can publish my report from tab box to Power BI service. OK, so I also uh, published some report. Uh, 
some reports uh, from my SIT environment to uh, this Power BI service also. Like you can see this, this is from SIT because uh, it will, when you deploy it, it will be same name. So it's hard to uh, differentiate which one is from dev, which one is from SIT. So it's better to put some naming convention and SIT rename it. So I just rename it with the SIT. And how do I know this is from SIT? So I go, I will go and check the setting and this is the data and then this is the uh, the setting from the uh, SIT environment. So I published some standard report also. So this is like created and collection. This is the Microsoft standard report. I published it uh, through uh, SIT. Right? So so th this is another and then uh, how we publish the report from the tier two environment. So uh, we saw that how we publish the report from the tier one dev environment. Now uh, let's see how we publish the report from the tier two environment. So in tier two environment, uh, if you want to use the Power BI service, first thing you should know that you have to create uh, the 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 client uh, ID and the secrets, and then you have to configure it in the Power BI configuration. So you have to configure it here, and you have to enable the Power BI integration, and then you put the application ID and application key. Okay, and then the second thing you have to do. You have to go and in the Power BI deploy powerbi.com, and then it will ask you to connect with the life life uh, life cycles LCS. And once it the success uh, is successful, then you can come back and then you can deploy the report. So I'm just uh, not going to do that. Okay, from my dev box. So I did it from my SIT environment and. Uh, and that's how we can see it in the Power BI service. So that's the uh, uh, that's the way we develop. Uh, we deploy the report from the TI2. So you can deploy from the SIT production and all that you can check in the Power BI service. <clears throat> OK, so. OK. So we saw this. Uh, uh, yeah, so now actually let's go to the uh, our uh, uh, Visual Studio again and, and dev environment. So what we saw that we created the aggregate measurement. OK, in the aggregate measurement, uh, I, I used uh, the view. OK, the query views and all and 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 then I, I, I was using uh, this uh, stage entity store. OK, so and then what I did when uh, then I developed, I created the Power BI report. And then I saved as a PBIX file, and then I came to the uh, my dev environment again. And here you you can go and add the resource. So when you add the resource, so it will ask to add the the file. So you can choose the Power BI file which you have saved somewhere in the the local uh, uh, desktop. So you can just uh, give the path and save it. So once it is saved, then everything is uh, will come inside the Dynamics. OK, then uh, this file will go in the AX resource and the Power BI files. OK, and then you can build this package and you can deploy it. So you deploy the package so then uh, with the regular deployment, it will go to your test environment. OK, so then uh, in, uh, 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 and then in test environment, once it is deployed, you have to go back again in the entity store. You have to. Uh, you need to enable the uh, entity store for that particular measurement. You have to run uh, uh, the batch job, the full set batch job. So once the batch job is done, then you can go to the. Uh, you can go to the uh, your Power BI workspace and see the report like I. Like I'm like how I'm seeing it. OK, so so then it will look like this report and this, because this is very, very powerful tool. Power BI desktop is a very, very powerful tool. You can do a lot of things uh, in the Power BI desktop. So I think this is, I think, one of the best uh, reporting tool I've ever worked uh, because it's very easy to work with. So a lot of functions uh, were provided in the Power BI desktop. So you can uh, build the Power BI report. So once you deploy the report, sometimes what happens, like you deploy the report, and you don't see anything. It's blank. It's like uh, no no data. Uh, nothing is there. So how how so how you troubleshoot it? So 
So that's why I added one slide for the troubleshooting. Like, so, uh, uh, <clears throat> like we we face like lot of issues. Like when we, so uh, for what what are the things you need to check? First, you need to check whether the entity store is enabled. Second thing, you need to check whether you the bad job was run uh, on time or not. Okay, and then then you need to check that like. Uh, uh, then still the data is not showing. So sometimes what happens like we have the deployment issue. So like like one example I showed that I, I was using the custom table and when we deploying it was not showing anything and, and it was very hard to know like what happened because that report was working the Power BI service, but it was not working inside the Dynamics because the Dynamics doesn't support the custom table and the import mode. So then slowly we learned okay that we can't use the custom table uh, and uh, uh, we, we need to use only the uh, direct query tables. Uh, OK, so yeah, that's okay. that's how we, we built this report. And after that, like uh, even after that, also like we faced one issue like uh, uh, we had everything correct. Uh, and it was faced bad job was running. We are using direct query. Everything was running and the report was also running a dev environment. But when we deployed in the SIT, it was failing and uh, and we didn't know like what what happened. So basically, what what has happened actually? If we go here, so in the Power BI desktop, you can do the edit uh, analytics. So you click on edit analytics. So it will show the report. So in my case, actually, it was showing the report, but it was not showing any data. Just all cross, nothing was showing. So. Uh, the problem was my report was not deployed correctly. So what I what we did actually that's another uh, thing. Uh, so we can we made some uh, we can we the here actually shows the restore option when there is some corrupt corrupt uh, Power BI file. So it shows the restore. So you have to click the restore and then it re restore the right file and then it deploys. Then it shows. So that also it took some time to find out the problem like uh, why it was not. Uh, 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 showing any data. OK, so. One more thing I want to know, like here, uh, because now we in edit workspace, so here you can add the filters and all. So the, this is the another, this is one problem that I uh, I found that the users reported uh, uh, this issue like uh, we, if we add any filters or anything here. So and when you save it, this this filter, it will be saved for all the users. OK, so when you go as an admin and you create some fil uh, filters and you save it, so that filter will be saved for all users. So that's the problem with the embedded Power BI. And in the Power BI service, you can save the filter by user. So when you save the filter, it actually retains your filter. When you open, next time you log in, you will see your, your own fil uh, filters. So that was the difference between the Power BI service and the embedded Power. So that's the usability issue. So. Maybe in future Microsoft might fix it. So. <clears throat> yeah, so what else? Yeah, so we covered all these points, uh, so and. <clears throat> so we covered this accessing the Power BI report from the test environment. Uh, and then I we, we call this Power BI.com configuration, deploy Power BI.com, how to deploy the reports from uh, uh, from the tier two environment. So let's uh, again maybe share. See if here if you go to system administration and uh, deploy Power BI.com. Because here actually I have all the correct configurations. So if I uh, if I deploy any report from here, it will go to the Power BI service and I can see it. It's loading. So another thing you need to uh, uh, know, like when uh, you actually deployed the report from DevBox in in the Power BI service and Sometimes what happens like when you deploy the report in Power BI service and it it doesn't show any data. So what what are things you need to check? So in the in Power BI service, if you go here in setting and 
Where is that? This, yeah, ma manage gateways. So here is the gateway that we I created from my DevOps. So you need to check whether this gateway is running or not. So if the gateway is not running, then it will not see the data. So in the Power BI service. OK. So this is like a, a, if you want to deploy any report from uh, uh, your tier two environment to Power BI service, you can go here and you can actually basically you can select and you can deploy. So once you click it, my this report will be deployed. Yeah, so deployment successful. So if I, I go here in my Power BI service, if I go to my workspace, so this is the one, and you can see this is the just time and just now I uh, published, and you can check. Uh, from where I published, so you can check the data source setting here, and you can sh you can schedule the refresh also. How, how frequently you want to refresh it, so that also you can do it here. So, yeah. So this is all covered. Yeah. So, so during this process, actually, what what uh, uh, what lessons we learned? Like uh, lesson we learned that embedded Power BI always uses the direct query. So because when I tried to use the custom table with import mode, it failed. Uh, so cannot use the custom table for Power BI desktop so, so because it uses the import mode, all the custom table. So if the logic is complex, uh, like if you're using uh, complex or then rather than writing the uh, the complex logic on the Power BI desktop in the, uh, the measure, it's better to uh, write inside the dynamics so uh, it can do the calculation before it push the data into the entry store. Choosing the correct reporting model, so sometimes uh, we we have the incorrect uh, reporting model, like I showed in one of my example that I was using the, the, the column rather than using the dimension. So if you use uh, the dimension and the star schema, so then it's like uh, it's better uh, reporting model and the performance is better. So and then I already shared the deployment issues uh, due to the corrected PBIX file. So. OK. So I, I also like uh, during my learning, like I have gone through like so many uh, documents uh, and I just uh, shared the references here in uh, um, in this page. Yeah. I think that's it from my end.